All righty. Well, hello, everybody. Again, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Derek Demeter. I'm with the Emil Bueller Planetarium at Seminole State College. We have a really, really cool program to uh, for you tonight, uh, hosted by my friend here, Kat Hunt. Uh, she's with the Ingram Planetarium at Sunset Beach, North Carolina. She put together this really, really awesome program about Asian astronomy, river and heaven, Asian astronomy. And um, I don't want to spend too much time. Uh, we want to get right to the action. If you're on uh, YouTube watching this, uh, be sure to leave some comments and of course also to subscribe to the Planetarium as well as um, uh, the Ingram Planetarium social uh, channels. So uh, without further ado, I want to go ahead and introduce uh, Kat Hunt. She's the Planetarium Manager at the Ingram Planetarium. So thank you so much, Kat, for being here tonight and uh, being able to present this amazing program you have uh, for our audience today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm so excited about this topic. It's something near and dear to my heart. Um, and I actually am adapting this uh, from a homeschool program I did for Asian American homeschool families uh, last year during the COVID lockdown. Um, so it's very special to me. Um, I do want to start by saying, you know, I am a professional planetarian. I'm not a historian. Um, so a lot of the knowledge that I come to in this topic is from doing that work. You know, every new planetarium person, presenter, uh, educator, what have you, one of the things that we do is try to bring in pieces of ourselves to the star shows that we do. So as I was exploring that many years ago when I first became a planetarian, uh, this is the direction that I took and I have kind of run with it. And there's a really important and, and very relevant reason why. Um, so I'm going to start by sharing my screen and I'm going to be flipping back and forth a little bit because uh, we're going to do some star show work uh, in our virtual environment here. Um, but first, I want to let you guys get to know what inspires me uh, to kind of go into this direction. Um, and just to make sure, uh, Derek, this is visible, right? I see it from my end. Perfect. All right. You never know. It's always good to double check. Um, so what inspired me to go in this direction? Well, I'm third generation Korean American and mixed race. So what that means uh, is I have a grandparent who immigrated here uh, from another country. And in this case, my beautiful grandmother, you can see her there to the right. And this is me on graduation day uh, again many years ago. Um, she immigrated from South Korea. She actually went from North Korea to South Korea, and then from South Korea to America. Um, so I have this heritage, but being third generation uh, and being, you know, separated from that part of my family by distance, what have you, I didn't always get to connect with her or my heritage as much as I would have liked. Um, so through my job as a planetarium educator, I fostered a connection to my heritage through astronomy. Astronomy is one of the oldest sciences in the world. Uh, and every culture all over the world has some connection to astronomy in some way. Uh, and, and through this, I was able to connect to my heritage and my culture. And I also use it as a way to serve my community, not just my local community, not just the science community, but my Asian American community. You know, many children like me, third generation or even second generation, we have a very complex relationship with our heritage because we are American, but we're also Asian, uh, and we may not get to experience the culture and the stories that we would if we were in our country of origin. So it helps me bring some of that to, to that community and share my culture with other cultures as well. So I do have a couple of notices just as we're beginning. Again, as I mentioned, I'm not a historian. Uh, I come to this through my planetarium experience. Uh, but I also want to make a few more notices just for everyone uh, to be on the same page with me and, and kind of understand uh, where I come from. English is my first and primary language. I'm not fluent in Korean, unfortunately. I would love to, to be fluent in Korean. And I'm learning as an adult uh, slowly. Um, and I also have a regional accent. I'm from the Carolinas. So even if my brain tries to pronounce things a perfect way, my tongue doesn't always cooperate. Uh, and again, Japanese and Korean culture is also what I'm the most familiar with as an individual. Uh, so I'm gonna bring a lot of that into the program, but Asian American 
it speaks for a lot of different groups, Chinese, American, Korean American, Japanese, Vietnamese, even Indian Americans, Desi American is another way you could say that. Uh, so do, do keep that in mind that I'm skewed heavily in that direction because of my own experiences. Another thing that kind of skews us in the direction of Japan, Korea, China, is the cultural exchanges of Asia in the past really bring context to that. So for us, for example, if you think about it, Roman culture influences us in the West a lot because the Roman Empire in our history was very prolific. Well, in Asia, the Chinese Empire was very prolific. So a lot of these stories were carried across countries and there's different variations depending on where you're from. So I'm trying to keep it very general. Uh, so it applies across the board. Uh, and this is a very kind of surface layer introduction. So I encourage you, if you have that heritage, or even if you're just interested to, to, di to dig deeper into those stories, learn about the different variations, if you will. Some of the stories that I'm bringing to uh, the topic also have at their deeper levels, some more mature themes. So I'm kind of editing some of that out uh, to be a little bit more well-rounded and family friendly. But again, I encourage you to, to delve into them deeper if you can. And last but not least, you can't fit all of Asia or South Pacific heritage in one hour of time. It's impossible. Uh, so do keep that in mind that this is just an introduction um, but I hope that some of you will take an interest and uh, learn more uh, in your own lives. So with that, I'm going to actually share a different screen. We're going to get into our star show portion uh, before we come floating back uh, to uh, my slides here. So we have our sky and everyone I hope can see that. <clears throat> and, uh, and I know it's a little bit small, but I'm going to try to keep it uh, to big chunks of sky uh, so that everybody can see it really well. So we're going to start in our north sky and, and as we begin to give this context, ancient civilizations were very skilled in astronomy all over the world and they depended on it even more so than we do today. You know, we, we study astronomy for scientific purposes and for enjoyment purposes or a combination of the two, but our ancestors all over the globe they lived by the stars. It was their clock. It was their calendar. It was a way to transmit information to and from their children and their grandchildren. So there is a lot of wealth and knowledge in the stars. And while it might seem sometimes very mystical to us from our modern lens, uh, they were very detailed astronomers, very good at making observations. And you see some of that in your stories. So as I'm talking about some of these star stories, I'm going to bring context to how they how they fit into the culture then and how they relate to modern astronomy today. And we'll start with the northern sky. Now I do speak for the northern hemisphere here. So if you're in the southern hemisphere, um, I do apologize, um, but Korea and a lot of the countries featured are more towards the northern hemisphere. Um, so we're going to face the north to get started. We're going to talk a little bit about our circumpolar region. Now, just for some astronomical background, I'm going to bring up a little uh, outline of this. The circumpolar region is the section of the sky that's over our North Pole. So as we rotate on our axis through our day, everything around us seems to move. Now, we know today that the Earth is moving. The stars, they change their position as we move through our day and through our year. In the circumpolar region, however, everything circles instead. And we see this very prominently with the Big Dipper as well. So I want to pull up the Big Dipper because the Big Dipper is featured in many cultures for this very reason, because it is circumpolar. So as I pull this up, we're going to talk about how it it kind of circles around. And a lot of cultures actually realized that this corresponded with certain seasons, for example, and the changing of time. So let's pull up our Big Dipper. So in Korean folklore, there's a couple of variations on the Big Dipper in Korean folklore. <clears throat> they noted that the Big Dipper or Bukchilseo circled around the sky and was always visible at night. They attributed the seven stars 
to seven sons that watched over and aided their, their mother. Now they built a bridge for her to meet her love, a widower. Now the Buddhist and Taoist influences that would proliferate through Asia would kind of turn this and adapt it. So this was a very original, very classic interpretation and star story that the Koreans had for the, the seven stars of the Big Dipper. But later with Buddhist and Taoist influences, this actually became a deity of sorts, the seven stars deity. And they said that it watched over the people throughout the night. Now, I love this because we know that the Big Dipper never actually sets below the horizon. Now, we're a little bit far south, so from my vantage point, you can see the circle does go below the horizon a little bit uh, because we're so far south. And for those viewing from Florida, it's the same way. But for many people in the Northern Hemisphere, this just continues to circle around and it's always up and always visible. So they made this very accurate observation. They just explained it in a very different way. Now, let's turn around and face the south. We're gonna talk a little bit about the moon next. Let's turn around and face the south. Luckily, we're not in a dome, so I hopefully won't make anyone dizzy by doing that. So in China, they actually were quite frequently observing the moon. And for us in the West, you know, you look up, you see the dark patches on the moon, right? What is one of the most common things that we see in the moon? It's the man and the moon, a face, if you will. And it looks like my moon is not out this particular night. So let me fast forward just a little bit. And we will find our friend, the moon. There it is, it's nice and full. So I'm going to zoom into the moon. The moon is, is right over there. I'm going to zoom into the moon. For the Chinese, it's common to interpret these dark patches as the jade rabbit, U2. And we'll come back to this figure in their mythology later in the presentation. But it said that this jade rabbit lives on the moon with the moon goddess, Chang'e. Now, there's a couple of stories that involve the jade rabbit. One is that he lives on the moon as penance for accidentally giving away the elixir of life. So if you see in this image, and I'll try to trace it out with my little, my little tiny hand, you've got the rabbit and you've got a little shape. It looks kind of like a box. So that's his pestle where he makes medicine. So Utu is a, a medicine rabbit and he accidentally gives the elixir of life away. And as penance, he goes to live on Chang'e, who is also punished for this, uh, on the moon. So that's one variation. There's actually a movie on Netflix now uh, called Over the Moon that's based on this, it's adorable. Uh, but there is a Buddhist inspired story as well. So the rabbit in Buddhist tradition is honored for self-sacrifice. It said that a, an elderly man is in the woods sick and he cannot move and he's trying to find food. So the rabbit actually sacrifices himself for the man by flinging himself into a fire to feed this sickly man. And this elder is actually the ruler of heaven disguised. And as a reward for his sacrifice, he is placed immortally in the moon. Now in India, let's come back down to our sky. In India, there's some connections to the constellations as well. There's also some connections to planets. We're gonna delve into a little bit of that next. So this is an example of how folklore was actually transmitted to other generations. You know, written word was not as prolific. If it existed at all, it was not as prolific. The everyday person didn't get a hold of books or scrolls. So how do you communicate information? How do you teach lessons? How do you talk about religion? Well, many people use the stars. So in India, they noticed something interesting about planets. Now planets, they move very differently through space. So we'll pull up our solar system. We can see how they move. 
Now, bear in mind, I've sped up time quite a bit. The planets don't really move this fast. The reason I bring this up, you can see that the planets move at different speeds. So unlike the stars in the sky that come up very consistently and set very consistently, people of the ancient world realized these planets, they kind of did their own thing. Uh, in fact, the Greeks are the origin for our word planet. It originates from a term that means wandering star. Well, the people of India noticed this as well. And many cultures would attribute this to those objects, those wandering stars. They were gods, they represented gods. So for people of India, Mars, for example, which is a red planet, it represented Mangala in Hinduism. Now for us, Mars translates to the god of war in Greek and Roman tradition. Well, Mangala was a very similar figure uh, for Hinduism as well. So many, many cultures did this. They would attribute the planets to being gods in the heavens. Now, coming back down to our sky, we can talk a little bit about Orion as well. We might have to do a little bit of time travel. I know I'm bouncing around a little bit. Orion is a winter constellation. It's one of the most recognizable because it's one of the brightest, right? I'm gonna fast forward to the winter sky. I'm gonna make sure I'm facing south. So for us in the Northern hemisphere, Orion is in the south. And Orion in Greek mythology is a hunter, but in Hindu traditions, this represents Rudra or Shiva. So many of us in America know this figure better as Shiva. They were originally Rudra. So in this particular story, this is a little bit of a story of caution. So Prajapati is a, a major god figure in Hinduism, and he pursues Ushas, the goddess of dawn. And the other gods do not appreciate this, and she doesn't appreciate it either. So she keeps turning into an animal over and over and over in order to escape Prajapati, and he just turns into that same animal. So they send Rudra, Shiva, to deal with him. So in this tale, we've got Orion. And I'm going to pull up Orion here. I'm going to get rid of the pictures. Those are based more on our Greek constellation. So you have Orion. Now, Orion is facing off in our traditions with Taurus the bull. The Taurus looks like this. Well, in the Indian tale, Taurus is a deer. So in the story, the final transformation of these two characters is that of deer. So we have Ushas, who is represented by the Pleiades, and she's very small in the distance, little group of stars. And in response to this, Prajapati turns into a deer to pursue her. And behind, you have Orion, who is Rudra, and he shoots Prajapati with an arrow, and his blood, in essence, spills out into the world. And this is how they explain the existence of the Milky Way in the sky. Now, that, for us, that's a segment of our galaxy. And you can see it a little bit. It might be a little faint uh, here in the, in the little itty-bitty computer screen, but there's a big band of light that stretches across the sky in the winter, and in the summer, assuming you have very low light pollution. Uh, so this is explained as the, the blood or essence of Prajapati and his showdown with Rudra. So we're gonna move next to our summer sky. We've seen now that our ancestors, they would tell their stories with the stars. They would also tell their religious tales or tell their tales of caution to the stars. And we see that they would also tell time with the stars. They would also sometimes describe natural phenomenon with the stars. So in our summer sky, we have a very bright group of three stars. I'm trying to find it in my screen here. So it's high in the sky in the summer. I'm going to shift around. Right now, we're in 
I'm in July now or in the summer sky. So it's, it's up more towards the east. This very big, bright group of stars we, we see, we call it sometimes the asters in the summer triangle. And there are two stars in particular that are in this group of, of three that are very important in a lot of Asian star lore. The two in question are Altair, which is a bright white star. And then you have Vega. Vega is a beautiful star. It's actually the brightest star in the summer sky, just to clarify, summer sky, not the brightest star in general. You have these two stars and they are, I'm going to tilt this a little bit more for us, they are kind of stretched out in the sky. And if you see the Milky Way in the sky goes right between them. So in a lot of Asian traditions, the Milky Way in the sky is called instead the Silver River in the sky. And this is where I get the name of my show here today, the river in heaven, because for a lot of traditions, it's not the Milky Way in the sky, it's a river in the sky. So these two come up quite a little bit. There's different variations on a very similar tale. It's kind of a Romeo and Juliet kind of tale. It's very lovely. So in these stories, Vega represents a weaver princess, the daughter of the Jade Emperor, and Altair represents a cowherd. Now, this is a very common theme through all variations. They are in love with each other, but they are separated by the silver river in the sky. Now, in Korea, this is a very practical application. They call these Jin Yao and Jin Yu. And their tears, as a result of their separation, are said to bring the late summer rain and have been incorporated in the rain rite traditions like those around the holiday chill seal. So in Korea, there's a rainy season and they notice these two bright stars are high above when it's raining all the time. And they attribute this rain to this story. Now in Japan, the Japanese version is a little bit more familiar in the West. Some of you may have even heard little bits of this uh, around. In Japan, these figures are called Orihime and Hikiboshi. Orihime is the princess, Hikiboshi the cowherd. And this story, a variation of it, actually inspires an entire festival that happens every single year in Japan. It's called the Tana Bada Festival or Star Festival. So this happens even today, in modern times, and it's based on these two stars. And some variations of the Japanese tale say that if it rains during the star festival, these two cannot meet. So in that variation, a flock of magpie build a bridge for them so they can meet. The Jade Emperor has granted that Orihime can see Hikiboshi one day a year. And then the rest of the year, both of them have to do their duties to the kingdom. So that was the problem to begin with. They were in love with each other and they kept hanging out a lot. Nothing got weaved and the cows went awry, right? So he decided, being the compassionate father that he was, to give them one day a year. And she could not cross that river. It was too perilous, but a flock of birds built her a bridge. So some versions say if it rains on the night of the Star Festival, they cannot meet for an entire year. Now, this very similar story does uh, inspire China some as well. It's at the origins of the Qi Xi Festival, also known as uh, the Chinese Valentine's Day. And there are lots of variations of this all over Asia. Now, coming back down a little bit lower, we're going to talk a little bit about some Pacific Islander heritage. And I'm not going to delve into it too deeply again, because uh, I am coming more from a Korean and Japanese standpoint. But I do want to mention this. This is a beautiful thing. And this is actually very connected to why I study these stories as well. So in the case of ancient Polynesian society, they use the sky as a tool for wayfinding. Now, to be clear, the current Polynesian star families are a fairly modern invention. They are part of a rebuilding of this culture. Uh, so several master navigators from the Pacific, the South Pacific, they came together with historians in the 70s 
and they rebuilt wayfinding as a culture. They rebuilt a traditional canoe and they developed these star families to navigate with. So there are all these Polynesian star families that they can navigate with. And I believe that uh, Derek actually had a program about this a while back that may be in the YouTube. Uh, that goes into it a little bit more deeply from a true Pacific Islander perspective. Uh, but one of the constellations that's in the star families is represented to us in our constellations of Scorpius, but it actually is Maui's hook in uh, the Polynesian star families. And this actually appears in the movie Moana as well. So if you're a Moana fan, watch that movie again. Look in the night sky. They actually highlight Scorpius. Uh, the scorpion in that film. Uh, so that's definitely an excellent uh, thing to study. Now again, uh, we, we do see a lot of timekeeping with our constellations as well as our uh, celestial objects. So coming back to the moon, the moon is how many cultures, even to this day, there are still cultures that still observe what we call a lunar calendar. And this is where the moon keeps the year. Uh, so the lunar calendar is gonna not fit in with the solar calendar perfectly because the lunar cycle is about 28 days. The solar cycles, 30, usually 30, 31. Occasionally you've got February, right? So it doesn't fit in perfectly. And this is why holidays like Chinese, or we like to call it Lunar New Year because a lot of different cultures celebrate Lunar New Year. Uh, this is why that day moves around. If you've ever wondered why does this holiday seem to move around? Sometimes it's in February, sometimes it's in January. This is why, because we're trying to translate the lunar calendar into the solar calendar so the days move around. Uh, so this is how they would keep time, they would keep time with the moon. So now we've learned a little bit about the star lore of, of Asia. I want to talk a little bit more about the astronomers and just how good they were. And one of the most phenomenal things that happened in ancient Asia is that they learned about eclipses. So if you've never heard of an eclipse, if you've never experienced one, it's pretty spectacular. So an eclipse is where the moon and the sun, you know, to, to really bring this down to a very small scale, this is when the moon and the sun align just right. And then the moon is very, very small, but because it's so close, it's able to actually block out the sun. And we had a really big trans, you know, it went from one coast to the other. We had a big solar eclipse back in two, 2017, if, if everyone could remember. So the Chinese actually developed a way of predicting the solar eclipse. So this was a huge feat and also required a lot of time. You have to take observations over a long period of time to understand the patterns. Now this was a really big deal because there's a lot of superstition around the solar eclipse in ancient China and other places as well. There was a lot of superstition and the Chinese in their culture, they said a dragon was eating the sun. But in later dynasties, it was actually a fatal error for an imperial astronomer. Yes, there were actually employed imperial astr astronomers to miscalculate a solar eclipse. So if there was a solar eclipse and the emperor did not know about it, that guy was in big trouble. And I do mean big. Uh, so it was a very big deal, but the fact that they were able to, to predict this was astounding for the time. They also, and I'm going to switch back to my slides next, they also were very good at documenting comets. Let's switch over back to our, our slide. So they were extremely detailed in comet observations. They would document them and they would do these really beautiful illustrations that would document what the tails looked like. Uh, so this was another thing. And, and the great thing about this, we use in astronomy today, we use some of this information from ancient China to track objects of today. Uh, so because of that, we're able to have more data, longer data, and track uh, celestial objects of today. They also had a very methodical report of a very infamous 
celestial occurrence. So where did my little slide button go? I have a lot of windows open. <laughs> there we go. So here's some data uh, from what they call the guest star. Now, the guest star was actually, we strongly believe, the 1054 supernova. We're going to talk a little bit about what that is. You can actually look at it today uh, with a telescope if you want to, or you can just go to the planetarium, or you can go online, of course. Uh, the 1054 supernova was close enough that we could see it from Earth with the naked eye, which supernovas happen a lot through the galaxy, but most are very far away, so we don't see them. Uh, but this one was so close, we could see it from Earth and was so bright. Um, supposedly, you could even see it during the day. Lots of cultures did see it. Many documented it in artwork, artwork, pottery, things like that. But China documented it in a very scientific way. You can see it here. They call it the guest star. So using their data, we're able to trace back to that event, which is really cool. Now, in modern day, the supernova 1054 is the Crab Nebula, supernova remnant. This beautiful nebula, and this is what it looks like uh, through telescopes and astrophotography. It's not gonna be this colorful if you're looking at it with just your eyes in a telescope, but uh, through astrophotography, we can get an image like this. So this same object, and this is so cool to me about astronomy, I'm looking at an object right now that my ancestors looked at hundreds of years ago. That's so cool to me. Um, so they documented that in, in a lot of detail. Now, Korea, this is something I'm really passionate about. A lot of people know that, that the Greeks were really good astronomers. A lot of people even know that Chinese were really good astronomers. I don't hear a lot about Korea. Korea was really good at astronomy too. In fact, uh, and I have the picture in my background. Uh, Koreans were responsible for the oldest observatory that we know of that's still standing. So we have the oldest observatory in the world uh, in Korea, and that's James uh, Ong. And uh, the other thing that Koreans are responsible for is the first concept of apparent brightness. So to, to give you a little astronomical background, what that means, you have stars and they're different brightnesses. You can go outside, you can see some are fainter than others, right? We call that magnitude. Well, there's absolute magnitude and apparent magnitude. Absolute is what they really are. Now, some stars can be super bright, but they're so far away that we don't, we might not even see them, right? Apparent magnitude is what we see, how bright they are from Earth. Um, so the Koreans, actually made a star map. And if you look at a star map, a, a paper star map today, you'll see bigger dots and smaller dots. And that is a visual representation of apparent brightness. The Koreans were the first one to make a map like that. They would document the apparent brightness with larger dots and smaller dots. So that's something uh, that the Koreans can take credit for, so to speak. Now let's talk a little bit about Asian contributions to science today. So one, we, we do have a very awesome lander. China landed on the moon. This has been a while. I'm terrible with dates, so I do apologize. I don't remember the year exactly. Uh, but just like we named our Apollo mission after a Greek god or Greek mythological person, uh, you know, we, we named Apollo after the god Apollo of the sun. And then and Artemis, which is our next series of moon missions, is after his sister. Well, just like we did here in America, the Chinese named their lunar lander the Chang'e lander. And the rover, the little, little mini rover they have on it, is the Utu rover. So it's the moon goddess and the medicine rabbit, or the jade rabbit, from our moon story just a little bit earlier. Now, both China and Japan have been incredibly involved uh, with the International Space Station project. And we've had lots of astronauts um, from those places visit. Now, the first Asian in space was actually from Vietnam. 
Uh, and they, they went with kind of along with the Russians, the Soviet side of, of space exploration. And the first Asian American in space, uh, Allison Onizuka was Japanese American. Now tragically, he died, he was in the Challenger shuttle, 1986. He was the first Asian American in space. And then we have our first Asian American woman and Asian woman, so the first Asian woman in space from China, Liu Yang, and, and then uh, Kampala Chawla from America. And tragically, she also did not make it home. She <clears throat> was in the Columbia shuttle, 2003. Um, so I definitely encourage you to look more into their, their life, their backstories. Um, we also collaborate with Asia Today. One big collaboration that's really cool, we have a, a telescope in Hawaii called the Subaru Telescope. And uh, the Subaru Telescope is actually named after the Pleiades. So the Pleiades, the name for the Pleiades in Japan is Subaru, which means to unite. There's actually a beautiful song uh, that someone shared with me. Uh, it's from... 30 or 40 years ago. It was an older song, but it was about the Subaru cluster. Um, and JAXA, which is the Japanese equivalent of our NASA, uh, they collaborate with us on the Subaru telescope. And this particular telescope is really powerful. It's actually one of the telescopes we use to find dwarf planets out in the outer solar system. And JAXA is also involved with the game. Project. So the Gateway Project, if you, if you don't know what that is yet, we are hoping to have a space station that orbits the moon in the near future as part of our, our desire and our will to get back to the moon and stay there and use it as a place of research and further exploration. Uh, so the, the JAXA organization is involved with that as well. Um, so we're very connected to Asia and we are very thankful for all of their contributions throughout history. And with that, I'm going to unshare my screen and open the floor for questions. All right, so thank you so much, Kat, for uh, the presentation. And uh, it was really cool to learn about all those different stories and um, contributions to, to astronomy. And one of the things I love about these cultural astronomy programs is it really reminds everybody that everyone all over the planet has has, has been inspired by the sky. And uh, hopefully when you look up at the night sky, you'll get a better appreciation for how much connected we are as, 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 as humanity. So um, we did have one question here. And by the way, if you do have a question, I wanna let you know uh, to go ahead, uh, you'll see on the bottom, it says Q and A, you can type that in there. You can also use the chat uh, if that's easier for you. I do have a question. We had somebody ask, um, what is the software that you're using for your planetarium uh, part portion of the program? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So the software I'm using, it's a direct reflection of what I use in my planetarium, only on a computer scale. Um, it's a program called Starry Night. And I want to give a big shout out to uh, Spitz because they provide us with our planetarium equipment and they gave us access to the computer version of Starry Night uh, last year so we could continue our outreach, uh, even though our domes were closed. Um, so it, it, it is a publicly available program to a certain extent. We have a very specific part of it that was designed specifically for planetariums. But Starry Night as a software, colleges use it as well. It's very powerful. Um, it is expensive for you know colleges to use. A very good comparable thing that you could use as a, just an amateur stargazer if you want to see what's up is Stellarium. Uh, it's open source on the computer and it's just a couple of dollars in the app store and we've used that. I used that in the college class I was an assistant for. Um, so it's very, very powerful. The biggest reason I use the software I did today is because it mirrors what I have in the dome. So I have all these files and favorites. I can just move from one to the other. Excellent. Uh, there's another question that we have here is where is the best place to be able to see more about the stories you've shared today? Oh, goodness. So, and I actually, I'm not sure, Derek, if you have a way to share it. I have a whole resource list that I developed with this um, unit that has some of the sources that I use. Unfortunately, there's no real 
one source <laughs> that you could go to. It took a lot of not only time, I've accumulated a lot of this knowledge incrementally, um, but it does require a little bit of, of digging. Um, so I have that list if, if you have a way to share it down the line. Yeah, um, if you want to send that, um, we could probably uh, add a link to maybe a Dropbox link or something like that uh, to the YouTube page. We can also add that to any of the other shares that we have available. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you have an actual document, you might be able to actually add that to the chat, I believe, um, but- um, yeah, copy and paste it real fast. Bear okay. with me just a second. Yeah, and we I will... go ahead and put that in the, the chat and we'll give you a few moments here. We got a couple more questions um, that, are, that are coming in as well, so, um, but, um, while she's uh, working on that real quick, I do want to talk a little about um, kind of our uh, plan for those that are uh, joining us today uh, that are supporting our planetarium and, and been curious, been getting a lot of questions about when are we going to open up. Um, right now, we are actually going to be taking a break during the summer. Uh, we're going to be doing some renovations. We're going to be doing some upgrades. We're going to be doing some maintenance. Um, but we are very hopeful that by fall of this year, so September, we will be officially reopened again for normal planetarium programs. So I want to let everybody know that um, we are hopeful that we'll be uh, reopened to do um, normal scheduled planetarium programs in the fall. So uh, just to let you know, um, so it looks like uh, um, Kat has posted uh, those links in the chat. So if you're interested in those inf that information, go ahead and be sure to look at the chat. For those that are on YouTube, we'll be posting those links on the uh, in the, um, the description part of the video. Um, okay, our next question we have is, can you comment on how different cultures across the globe wound up identifying the same star groups as being important? So this is, this is more my critical thinking in play. I can't say with 100% certain, certainty that they did for one reason or the other, but it's a couple of factors from my research, one of the biggest things is if you look out, you can you can pick out the, the brightest stars, right? And most of the stars that connect our cultures are the really bright ones, the ones with the high apparent magnitude. Um, and they just stand out. And many of them will see them differently. And they may even have different patterns that their brain sees, just like we see a man in the moon and China see the rabbit in the moon. Um, but the stars themselves, are gonna stand out no matter where you are because they are so bright. So that's one reason. Another reason is in the ancient world, especially as we began a merchandise society, you know, even if cultures weren't necessarily infiltrated, conquered, what have you by other cultures, there was still transactions of information through trade. So, you know, if a Chinese salesperson who was bringing in, you know, silks and things was going into Europe, you know, they might have their stories that they're telling along the way. And then the European civilizations that are there are like, oh, that's a cool story. And, you know, it's kind of like the gossip column of the ancient world. They go to their neighbor, oh, check out this cool story. So this transaction of information we see in other contexts as well happens through trade. Um, so that's another reason that some of those similarities might be there. Um, and it's not an Asian example, but it's one that's very relevant, I think, um, to answering this question. A good example of that, there's another story I tell about Corvus the Crow. Well, for the Celts, Corvus the Crow, the exact same constellation is translated into Bran's Raven. So they adapted what the Romans brought into Europe and they applied their own story to it. Uh, so the shape is very similar, the stars are the same, but they have a different story that reflects their identity and their culture. That's kind of an example of how that type of information moves across continents in the ancient world. And one of the, one of the things that I, I find really interesting too um, is again, a, a, you know, Galileo brought this idea, or excuse me, Newton brought this idea that we stand on the shoulder of giants and Kat brings up a very important thing about trading. Uh, Ari Bada, which was an Indian astronomer, wrote a lot about heliocentrism and actually was 
those writings were brought by specifically the uh, Muslim conqueror, and in this case, the conquerors, the, the Muslims that actually traded with the Europeans after the Crusades, that actually most likely inspired Copernicus with his ideas of healing syndrome. So, you know, when we look at history, we learn history, we, we always learn, especially here in America, this Eurocentric uh, history system. But in reality, a lot of the things that we think of that Copernicus is the one that figured out heliocentrism, not really. There are people in other parts of the world that were doing it way before. Um, and that's something that we want to work together on in trying to kind of, you know, enlighten and bring up these ideas to everybody. So uh, that's a really great, uh, uh, you know, question and an answer on that as well, and how important it is to, to talk about that. Uh, actually, I have a question for you, Kat, because I get a lot of this question asked to me, specifically when we talk about Asian astronomy, is because in the ancient world, astrology and astronomy were very synonymous. We talk about the royal uh, court of Chinese astronomers. They were also astrologers because they were trying to see what was happening. And, you know, people always ask me about the Chinese zodiac, you know, the year of the tiger year and so on. Can you talk a little bit about the um, kind of the importance of that from not only the astrological, but there's actually a lot of connections to the astronomical as well to that. Cause that's something that a lot of people see a lot uh, and hear about as well. Yeah. So, and the, the same kind of goes for our Zodiac as well at its, at its basic root as basic root, it was a way to keep time. So when you don't have birth certificates, right? You don't have birth certificates. How do you know how old somebody is? Well, they would assign certain signs to the year that you were born. And you would say, you know, I'm the year of the tiger. I happen to be the year of the snake. Well, I'm not very old. So you can kind of count, you know, you've got a range. You can count how many years past the year of the snake. Well, you're not a little kid. So let's go back a little bit further. So you're like, you know, 31, right? So at its, at its basic root, uh, Zodiac, is a way of keeping time in the Chinese constellation. I didn't delve into it too deeply because in honesty, I haven't learned as much about those constellations as much as the Korean and the Japanese stories. Um, but there is, I do know they're like big constellations. They're much bigger than the ones we have. There's three or four, I believe. Uh, don't quote me on that. Again, it's not my area as much but they take up a lot more of the sky than the constellations we're used to using today. Um, but the signs themselves, those were just kind of a way of record keeping, basically. Um, and you could say, you could go up to somebody and say, oh, oh, I was born in the year of the, the snake. And you know, that would tell them how old you were. Um, now the superstitions around that, you know, that there was a lot of superstition around a lot of things in the ancient world. Um, because they didn't have the same equipment, they didn't have the same experiences as we do to look at the world. So they would explain very strange phenomenon with something that was either religious or mystical. Uh, even personality traits could be explained, like why is a person the way they are? You know, and that's a question that we, we grapple with today now. You know, and we, we use science, psychology, neurology, et cetera, to learn and explain why people are the way they are. Why do people behave the way they behave? In the ancient world, they didn't have that, but they would explain it away with, oh, well, they were born in the year of the, the tiger, or they were born in the year of the snake. So those are the, the basic roots of, of all of those systems of, of knowledge. Yeah, definitely. And, and one of my favorite stories, um uh is uh from that whole thing uh, especially in chinese mythology is why the cat was kicked out of the uh of the zodiac because of you know the being deceived by the rat and all that stuff it there's a lot of amazing i mean we could spend probably hours telling us telling all these really great stories so hopefully uh, we see a couple of our members here today really appreciated your program tonight and have kind of inspired them to continue their knowledge and their discoveries about um cultures in asia um, so thank you so much. Uh, we have a couple more questions. Uh, another question we have here is what's it, what is it like to be, uh, in the observatory that you have as your virtual background? Sadly, I don't yet know because I've never been to Korea. It's on my list of things that I would love to do. And certainly this site is a place I would visit. 
Uh, so hopefully we can start traveling again. I actually was was trying to plan in the next few years a trip uh, to Korea. My grandmother goes about every other year. So I was going to try to tag along with her one year. Um, but we'll see. So I don't really know <laughs> what it's like to be in that observatory, unfortunately. Yeah, no, definitely. It, it's on my list for sure as well to, to visit that. And hopefully we'll be all able to start traveling again soon and we'll be able to explore some of these amazing uh, astronomical areas. And uh, we have one uh, other question here. You mentioned that Chinese astronomers documented the astrological event. How did they document it? Why did they say other that naming it? I think what they're trying to ask is, uh, how do they actually go about naming and documenting what they saw in the sky? Um, did they do, do they use telescopes? Did they use just their eyes? I think that's what they were asking is in terms of, you know, what do they do to make those observations? So a lot of the astronomy I referenced in the program was naked eye astronomy because they hadn't quite got telescopes at, at that point. You know, uh, the first to our knowledge, or at least to my knowledge, the first astronomical telescope was used specifically for that purpose was in the 1600s, Galileo uh, used it in 1610. So a lot of what uh, I referenced as far as ancient Asia was naked eye astronomy. And they had different ways of documenting things just like we document stars today. And uh, like in the case of the 1054 supernova, they called it a guest star because they knew about all the other stars. And they were like, okay, there's all these stars and they come back every year, but now we've got a new one and it's really bright. So they called it the guest star um, and they would document it, you know, daily. And astronomy is a science of patience. So you're talking about people who stared at the sky every day, all year long for years and years and years and years and years. And then their prodigies would do the same thing for years and years and years. And a lot of these cultures are very long lasting ones. I, and again, I'm terrible with dates. So the Chinese empire, the ancient world lasted for a very long time, right? So they had a lot of data transfer from person to person over the years. All right, I think that pretty much covers all the questions. Um, so thank you so much again, Kat, for joining us tonight and presenting this program. Is there anything that you want to mention about your facility or any other programs that you're doing or, or whatever that maybe some of our guests, hopefully again, now things are starting to open up again. People are you know vaccinated who are willing to travel and see things is uh, just, you know, is there anything you want to mention before we finish up here? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we are, we're in a fairly unknown beach. A lot of people around the country don't know Sunset Beach by name. But you do know Myrtle Beach. We are 45 minutes from Myrtle Beach. So if you're coming into Myrtle Beach, you know, come see us. We're not a very far drive. We have a ton of really cool programs. We're definitely open. Um, we've been open for a little while and um, we've got a lot of fun things for the summer. For us, it's tourist season. So we're cranking it up. We're going to have 60 hours worth of shows every single week, star shows and laser shows. Um, so if you're in the area, just come say hi. I'd love to see you. Fantastic. And uh, so, yeah, so go go see Kat in her planetarium. And so, uh, again, uh, thank you all for joining us tonight for our program, River in Heaven, Asian Astronomy. And uh, for those that are watching on YouTube, be sure to leave a comment, like, uh, share, and of course, subscribe to our uh, our future videos. We'll, we'll release other videos and other seminars that we do uh, through this. And again, thank you so much, Kat, for being here tonight. And with that, I hope you all have a great rest of your day and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.